Uh, should we uh, should we add in our next guests? We should. Let's bring him on. I feel like Redbeard actually gave the best intro because he was just talking about how interconnected it all is, not just to the people, but also, or not just the technology, but also the people. And so I'm really excited to introduce some folks. We've got Charity Majors, who's the CTO at Honeycomb. Hi, Charity. Thanks for joining us today. And then we've got Amy Toby, who's a principal SRE here at Equinix Metal, as well as Mai Trong, who's also the field CTO at Equinix Metal. And, you know, before we get started, you know, I got to ask a random question to our guest. So it's going to be Charity, since everyone else on the call is part of the Equinix family. And Charity, so we hear that you consider television to be the highest modern art form or serial television to be exact. So tell us what should we all be watching right now? Mute. Well, if you haven't seen Fleabag, you must see Fleabag. Um, it's pretty excellent. I'm actually, I just started listening to this. I also think that Buffy the Vampire Slayer is probably the best series ever. So if you liked Buffy, you should find the, pu the podcast called Buffering the Vampire Slayer. It's really, really well done. They go through each of the episodes at a time. They actually compose an original song for each one. Uh, it's pretty fantastic. Um, and if you haven't seen The Wire, The, the Wire is what, we real, what made me realize that, that, you know, modern serial television is basically analogous to like, Dickens, you know, at the era when they were putting out novels one chapter per week in the newspaper and making little adjustments to the story based on the reaction from readers. Uh, so, yeah, those those are my off the top recommendations. Those are really great recommendations. And I'm going to spoil Buffy for folks who have never seen it. As someone who has seen every single episode of Buffy at least once, some twice, some thrice, don't judge me. I got to say that the episode that's entirely silent, when those kind of like extraterrestrial like folks come and take away everyone's voice and it's filmed entirely in black and white, it's like, I don't know, Hitchcock meets like a Coppola. It's just beautifully shot. And yeah. the music, like the score for that episode is It was an Emmy, I think. And apparently he did that in reaction to critique that his series were all about the, the snappy one-liners and stuff. And so I would pair that with, uh, yes, Hush was an amazing episode. But uh, What's More With Feeling, the musical episode, was equally just incredible. Just It was fantastic. Amazing. Awesome. Well, I'll let you all not talk about Buffy, but instead talk about tracing outside the lines. Sorry, you 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 like you, you started us down this down this 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 direction. I don't know if it's gonna be possible to <laughs> I'm, turn I'm around now. I'm gonna get y'all back on this train track. So this I'll, is now a Buffy podcast. Exactly. <laughs> I'll, let you, I'll let you all go ahead and start the conversation. Thank you. All right. Well, I was I woke up and I realized, gosh, I really should have asked for for my contact information because I woke up and I was just like. What are we doing? So, <laughs> gang, what are we doing today? Shall I start with my slides? Do you have your slides? Uh, what do you think? We have some. Uh, why don't you go first? And then we'll work into them. That sounds great. Cool, cool, cool. All right. How do I share my slides in this? So, so well, share. There it is. Much like uh, releasing firmware for um, servers. We're testing things, in production here. We, we've, we've, yeah, we've kind of just like put all this together and we're doing it in production. <laughs> exactly. And we've got great observability. We've got a whole audience out there to keep it, keep an eye on us. And perfect. There's a chat thing somewhere. We'll find all the questions. Don't worry about it. <laughs> we'll fix it. We'll fix it live. All right. Slide, you see slide? Hey, yes, I do. Hey, awesome. Well, this talk is about continuous delivery, um, which which you all may have, if, if you pay attention to, to the Twitters, you may have seen some rants um, recently. But a question that I really often get asked is, and sometimes very uh, accusingly is like, well, that's fine for you, you know, web software people. But like, <laughs> what, what about us that do real work? Right, like, what about us who have those of us who have IoT or medical devices or hell 
mobile or anyone who, you know, we can't just like, you know, screw around with our users in, in you know, 15 minutes or less. So I'm going to kind of quickly run through the argument for why this, this interval uh, between when you write the code and when you, when you ship it is, is so incredibly key to, to your culture, to your, your team's like high performingness to, to everything. And then my and, and Amy, which by the way, feel free to like, chime in at any point during these slides you guys uh, but but after i do this um, they're going to kind of take over and talk about why this is actually even more important for people who have really high you know production um, quality requirements so that said uh, for those of you who don't know me my name is charity um, i wrote the database reliability engineering book with lane um, uh, we have the observability engineering book um, i just wrote my last chapter uh, Liz Fong Jones has not yet written her last chapter. <laughs> Hi, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> but it is in pre-release, and uh, we, it, it's out there. If you want to download it for free and, and give us feedback, you should do that. So, how well does your team perform? This is not just a question for managers. Obviously, this is a question for for everyone, right? We co-create these teams every day when we show up at work. Um, one asshole can sink a team. <laughs> you know, one this is not something any of us can be apathetic about. Um, and by the way, this is not the same as saying, how good is your team at engineering? It's not the same at all. Um, but high-performing teams, we should all want to be on high-performing teams because high-performing teams get to spend most of their time solving interesting problems that actually move the business materially forward. Lower-performing teams do not. <laughs> um, if this sounds like your job, I'm sad. For you, um, I, I I've spent a lot of my my time at work in, in this state too. So so like you're not alone. But you know, engineering can be such a beautiful occupation. You know, we we all were drawn into it by our curiosity and our love of solving puzzles and and having you know a lot of impact on the world. Um, but it has a real dark side. <laughs> there's there's a lot of just like toil and yak shaving and and shit work that you can slide into very quickly if you're not careful. And, and this is kind of a spectrum, know, right? Like, like, yeah, you could you sure. could be anywhere between these, and and even a, a high performing team might have periods where oh, yeah. it's down in the low performance territory, and vice versa. Completely true. In fact, nobody is ever one hundred percent either of these. Um, it is a spectrum. Thank you. And if you want to know how high performing your team is, um, a really good place to start, of course, is with the Dora metrics. How often do you deploy? How long does it take for your code to go live? How many of your employees fail? How long does it take to recover? I would always add a fifth, which is how often do you get paged outside of work hours? Every manager should be tracking this. In fact, I think that you know it can be really hard to evaluate managers on, on how well they're performing, um, but tracking this um, is as good a proxy as good a proxy for as any. I think. Um, while it is true that these teams are spectrum, um, there is a pretty big gap between you know, the, the good teams and and the less so good teams. Um, and again, I want to stress this is not a question of the best engineers. This is about this is about teams. Um, and if you look, you know, year over year, sadly, the last year we have was 2019. But, you know, the the trends are that, you know, more and more people are figuring out to be I don't really like the term elite. So I, I just use high performing uh, more and more teams are figuring out how to be, you know, very high performing. Um, but the bottom 50% is is not just staying still, it's losing ground, which to me it speaks to the fact that, you know, in software, um, if you're if you're not moving, <laughs> if you're not trying to stay up, stay ahead, if you're not changing, you're losing ground because you know it's 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 not it's not a static system. Things decay, things degrade. Um again, it, it really pays off to be in a high performing team. 208 times more frequent code deployments, <laughs> 2,600. That makes me so sad looking at the ones where it's like, it takes between one and six months um, to recover. Oh my God, kill me now. Um, so if you're talking about like, how do, how do we, is that, are you talking? I was gonna say, I, I, I saw a team, I uh, worked with the team uh, about a year ago that, um, had a release that was going into its second month of trying to roll out oh, <laughs> and it was it was miserable for everyone oh man all the merges merge failures oh fuck 
So how do we make these high-performing teams? Well, obviously, you just hire the smartest people, right? (laughs) 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 No, this is this causality. Like, there's obviously something linked here between, you know, being a good engineer and being high-performing teams. But the linkage actually goes in the opposite direction. Great teams are what make great engineers. You know, if you think about, you know, we stand in the... Somebody was just making this point as I hopped on. We stand on the shoulders of so many hundreds of thousands of amazing people trying to drive the best practices, you know, and, and better practices and to, to continually improve. And, you know, our, our profession is very much one of apprenticeship. I mean, I'm, I dropped out of school. I'm a dropout music major, but maybe those of you who are CS grads can tell me, did you learn all the skills that you needed to excel at work at, in your schooling? <laughs> Yes, I was a music major too. Oh, well, there we go then. And I did yeah. learn all the skills I needed to be successful in this industry. I, I feel left out here as like a professionally trained engineer. The only thing that I really learned <laughs> is to learn at the end of the day. That's exactly, exactly. Setting aside the question of whether you can even really evaluate the best engineers, um, you know, and people try to compensate for this by hiring all the ex-Googlers, all the ex-Facebooks and stuff. And it's not that that strategy doesn't work for some definition of work, but it's a question of opportunity. You know, like the the engineers that are the best in the world at running these large distributed systems are going to be the ones who have gotten to train, <laughs> you know, on the world's largest distributed systems for two to three years. You know, it's, it's, it, it yeah. Well, and more importantly, uh, they got to see good. They right? got like to something see I've good. seen out in the world is talking about this stuff is there's so many people out there who've just never seen a high never performing seen it. team. And so when we're trying to it. communicate to them why we do the things we do, it's it's really frustrating sometimes. So like, why would you do that? It seems so silly. And we're like, trust me. Exactly. And, and, but that's it's it's hard to make that even bridging from from it's up to it's those really hard. It's hard. It's hard, it's hard on so many levels because if you've never seen it, you're taking it on faith, right? And you're trying to pitch something to your to both your team. Say I'm saying speaking from the engineering manager's perspective, right? You're you're trying to pitch it upwards to people who are very skeptical about this. You're trying to pitch, pitch it downwards, you know, to your team, which is like, what? But we have something that sort of works, and why would we upset this apple cart? You know, um, yeah, it, exactly. I could rant about this and Amy could do all day, so let's move on. Let's just put, put it this way. Who's going to be the better engineer in two years? <sighs> there, and there's another element there, right? Um, is burnout. The, a lot of Completely. people think that burnout's like key feature is overworking, but it turns out the real key feature yeah. of, that leads to burnout is when people are, are, are in that you're, right you're side. Not making, They're you're miserable. Making, Yes, when you're yeah. straining to, to like move half an inch a week, right? Or mm-hmm. or you find yourself sliding back week over week. Um, that's what that's what burns people out. Software engineers don't get burned out by shipping. They get burned right. out by not shipping. By not shipping, yes. Get those sweet, um, sweet dopamine hits. Yeah, ex- <laughs> oh, exactly, exactly. This, this, that's just all about dopamine hits, I'm all about it. <laughs> But like, what happens when an engineer from your like elite bubble joins a team, you know, in the mid-performing bubble? A lot of people are like, aha, suddenly your team will get way better. It doesn't work that way because so much of your ability to execute at, at a high level of performance has nothing to do with your personal mental library of algorithms and data structures, right? It's about the library support and the tooling and the standardization of tool chains and the architecture and the dependencies and the code reviewing policies and, you know, how much time you spend waiting on people at every stage and how much, you know, you're causing other people to wait at every stage and and your your deploy chain. And, you know, I'm sorry, if, you're, if it takes, you know, a day to deploy your code, it doesn't matter if you just came from a team that was shipping every 10 minutes. Uh, it's, it's, you know, this is like the 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 fundamental the FAE the fundamental attribution error that sociologists <laughs> always talk about, but like it's not about you it's about the system we we have to pay a lot more attention um, to the quality of the system. It's a function of the socio technical system that that you participate in, which is why anyone cons- who considers himself a technical leader needs to focus intensely on constructing and tightening these feedback loops at the heart of the system. Which brings us to CICD. Speaking about feedback loops, I, I personally think that the fear of deploys is the single largest source of technical debt in most organizations. 
Um, I also love this, this quote that the intercom folks always cite, which is that if you're a tech company, shipping is the heartbeat of your company. It should be, it should be a biological function. It should be so predictable, so regular, so uneventful, so ordinary that you just don't even have to pay any attention to it because it just works. So how do we get there? Well, CICD. And if I ask people, do you do CICD? Most people are like, hell yeah. <laughs> we got a Circle CI account. <laughs> we run tests almost every time we we merge code. That almost and, seems important. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's CI, right? That's lots of people are doing CI these days. And when the CI CD book was written, like what, 15 years ago, they kind of hedged on CD. They're like, well, it's a, you don't have to deploy every time. It's about, you know, continuous delivery, which means you've just done all the tests so that you're ready to deploy every time. But I feel like by now what we've learned is that um, <laughs> um, both that's, that's a cop out. Um, if you haven't done it, you can't say it's doable. Um, because code is not code in isolation. Code only exists as an intersection between this point in time, this infrastructure, this user load and this code, the entire fucking point of CI <laughs> is to get you to CD because continuous is now, element right? is what will change your, change mm -hmm. your life. Because there's a lot of that, like if, if people want to talk about the, the kind of where it started, it started in a world that was very different from where we are today. People, we were delivering Absolutely shrink wrap different. software to enterprises. And so exactly. like the whole testing cycle is very different from where today, when we deliver our software, we deliver it straight onto servers. Very exactly. different world. Exactly. And over the past five years, I think we've seen this huge gravitational shift away from all of this, like, you know, <laughs> all of this anxious, like pre-production, you know, we'll give everyone a staging environment. Like you get a staging environment, you get a staging environment. <laughs> how, about we, how about if we have test and UI test and pre-staging and staging, and then like, you know, like all of this elaborate staging shit, but like we've reached a point of continue of like, uh, of like, pff, what is the phrase I'm reaching for? We, we, results, of, results have stagnated, let's put it that way. Um, and, and we've started to put the focus on where it should be, which is production, right? All the tooling for production, we've seen the, the companies of the past five years alone, like Honeycomb, Lunch Darkly, you know, the Gremlin folks, all of the, you know, chaos engineering stuff. It's all putting the lens on production where it should be because your testing is not done <laughs> until you've seen it run in prod. And if you aren't going to hook CI up to production, honestly, why even bother? Just Write, write you a little shell script, say exec bash, you know, <laughs> while true, run your, run your tests from your laptop, the same deal. <laughs> Any CI CD job that ends without your code and prod was a fail run, period. Um, <clears throat> I've talked a lot of smack about feedback loops, so let's look at what a good feedback loop actually does look like. Um, the, the platonic ideal, let's say, of a CI CD feedback loop looks like this. Engineer merges a change to, to, to main with any user visible changes safely hidden behind a feature flag, which triggers CI to run tests, delivers an artifact, which is then deployed or canaried or, you know, it's in some automated way with no user buttons or interference um, reaches production um, in under 15 minutes, 15 minutes or less. So some important things to note about this, um, only one change set by one engineer per artifact. Um, this is super important because it helps establish code ownership. If you know your changes are going live in 10 minutes, you're gonna go look at them. If you know that your changes and one to 10 other people's changes are probably gonna go live at some point in the next day and a half, you're not gonna look at it. <laughs> Just not. Uh, no manual gates, no manual QA or variable times. And this, this, this predictability is I think just as important as, as it being 15 minutes or less. Predictability is what, what hooks into your, your, your physical motivation. Your, it, it helps it become muscle memory for you to, you know, merge, look, right? It, it helps you hook into your dopamine heads. It's, it's, it's how you get that uncomfortable feeling in your stomach that you're not, that you're not finished yet if you haven't gone and looked at them in prod, right? And feature flags are what decouple deploys from releases. I'm not arguing, a lot of PMs get really anxious and upset and they're like, but we can't just release constantly. And it's like, no, that's not the, that's not the point. Um, you can plan your releases, you can do all that stuff. The point is to get the code into production 
as quickly as possible. And this is the way. <laughs> this is the way. Um, and it's really, it's all about that one little interval between when you wrote the code and when you can look at it in production. Hmm. That code interval is precious. Keeping it small is like the cornerstone building block of any high performing team. Because it's my favorite quote of all time, I think software on the shelf ages like fine milk. <laughs> <laughs> it's not wine, it's milk, right? At the moment when you finish solving a problem, like you've just, you've just like been through battle, right? You know exactly why you're charging up this hill. You know all the trade-offs you had to make. You know where, where the rot is stored. You know, you know the variable names, you know, you know, you know everything, you know as much as you could ever know about this piece of software. And the minute you've changed your attention away and started to swap, you know, swap, swap state, um, <laughs> it, it, that knowledge that you have decays. And nobody, no matter how much you write comments, no matter how much you document, no matter what, nobody can ever regain that, that, that state that you had in your head when you, when you were merging your code. The context this vanishes. Why, Context vanishes yep. and context switching is a killer, which is why, you know, engineers can find 80% of all bugs or more in that, in that beautiful little interval, as long as you have good observability tooling, not just monitoring. I'm not going to go on that rant at this point in time, but you need observability. You need to have a habit of instrumenting your code as you're writing it with an eye towards your future self in an hour. I'm going to need to understand this in production. How am I going to know if this is working or not? And then you close the loop by going and looking at it. And you ask yourself, is it doing what I wanted it to do? And does anything else look weird? Having that be predictable lets you hook into all of your intrinsic reward systems. It makes it feel like riding a bicycle. It makes it feel easy. It makes it feel effortless. It it let it gets you back to the fun that you had in coding, like when you were a little wee kid, you know, who didn't have production responsibilities. <laughs> the short interval actually is really important also because it lets you hold the line against batch deploys. Um, because as soon as you know, if you're if you're if you have an automated thing that kicks off and, and deploys as soon as you merge someone's changes, great. You're only getting it one person per artifact. But if you if you're manually doing it, or if you like, you know, if it if it's an hour or two hours, you're gonna have more diffs that are like lining up waiting to get into prod, right? So you're gonna start batching them up. And this this destroys that beautiful little feedback loop of software ownership. And it starts to get grim pretty quickly, honestly. Um, if your interval is on the order of hours or days, um, you start to slip into what I think of as the software development death spiral, which is that you have a longer interval between when, when the code is written deployed, leads to larger diffs, longer turnaround for code review, more time spent paging state in and out of brains, changes getting batched up and deployed, severs your ownership, Blah, blah, blah. You're spending all this time waiting on each other. So you need specialists and more people in teams, which more coordination costs and more people waiting on each other, which costs more time, which is why, you know, you can spend your whole life changing using all these symptoms and pathologies, or you can fix it at the fucking source. 15 <laughs> minutes or bust. And how much of your fear is your fear costing you? Because my rule of thumb, which is not pessimistic, this is optimistic, is that it takes double the engineers to build, maintain, and run your software if you have an interval of hours. With an interval of days, double it again. Weeks, double it again. Um, this is, this is people look at me as sideways when I say this, but it's actually optimistic because the best data that we have was published by Facebook. I tweeted it out a few times recently, which says that it's an exponential growth. Uh, it's exponentially more costly to find, fix, and solve a bug the longer it goes after you you first write it. And I think but if most people think about that, that they can int intuit it and think yeah, about it, the the, si yeah. the software we see from large organizations and the release cycles and the time it takes them to fix things. We can see yeah. that, right? So you know the uh, anyone who's ever worked at a team that's high performing feels this in their gut. Mm -hmm. But it isn't just about the economic arguments. Like the question of how well does your team perform? Like this is a quality of life issue. <laughs> Software engineering has the potential to be such a creative, exciting, fulfilling career. And, and like for businesses, like you should want your team to be, you know, moving the business materially forward 
This is why you hired all these expensive engineers, right? And I'm not saying anyone, I'm not making a pitch for working anyone into the ground. I don't believe anyone has more than three, four hours a day of real intense engineering effort in them. That, that's, that's, that's what you've got, right? And instead of trying to like magically expand that, which I don't think we can do. So you can, you can work more hours in that email, you know, code review, whatever, but like you've got three or four hours a day. Um, and, and all of the, all of the progress in the world is made by people who have, who have gotten good at using those three or four hours a day to move the business forward instead of spending it in rabbit holes. And because it's a quality of life issue, it's also an ethical issue. And from a from a pure capitalist, you know, nickel and dime point of view, it really helps with hiring and recruiting and retention. Nobody who's worked with true CICD is willing to go back to the fault lines. So, you know, let's build better systems. Let's build great teams that foster the next generation of great engineers. Um, systems that are well instrumented, well understood, compatible with adult life. You know, teams that are low in toil and high in autonomy, mastery, and meaning. And you do We're it trying. by. I know, honey. I know. It's the, it sounds so easy, right? Yeah. It, sounds so easy. <laughs> it, it, is, it is difficult, hard work. Um, but this slide really sums up um, <laughs> the truth of things. Are you too yeah. busy to <laughs> no, thanks. We are too busy. All right. I'm going to stop. I hope I didn't go too long and let you guys take over from here. Yeah. Uh, Amy, you want to throw up our slides? Sure, yeah. Let me get them. I don't have them here. And yeah, so like while we're walking into this, like one of the adventures that we have over on the Equinix side is really getting into that velocity of deploying at a regular cadence around some of the pieces that matter for our infrastructure. Um, as an organization in Equinix Metal, like what we really actually care about is getting our servers into customer hands with the least amount of problems along that path. And it's uh, a surprisingly difficult journey if any of you have ever actually put hardware in production at a reasonable clip, you know that all sorts of things go off the rails really, really fast for reasons unknown. And the reasons unknown are the areas that we really want to stop the action and actually really actually fix seriously um, at the same time. So um, to that end, one of the adventures that we've kind of started along the path on, um, and we've written a, a blog post and we love the uh, community to engage us on, our adventure down the OpenBMC path. Um, OpenBMC is a very different software piece uh, of the world around BMCs. Maybe when we get the slides rolling. Yeah, yeah, yeah I was. Uh, there, you there you go. There you go. Look at this. <laughs> uh, so I, I was how, trying to how, do the right thing for security to make sure I didn't expose my whole screen. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, like uh, maybe if we can go to the next uh, slide here. Yeah. Really, one of the things that we we started struggling with pretty heavily is that BMCs are kind of the last bastion of really classic enterprise software think in our ecosystem. Um, we freed up operating systems on x86 processors. We've brought all sorts of really modern software architecture patterns to ourselves. But the one final like place that we have a tremendous amount of pain uh, is around the BMC. And so like that little controller that controls your your server and does the simple thing of turning it on and off causes you utmost pain when you really want it to work. And when it doesn't work for you, it's kind of uh, mm. a sad experience, right? s and MP, I just got a cold shiver down my back. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, like I, I like to say, like I, I facetiously say this, but like I think there's a bit of truth here is like, I like to say like the late 20th century called and asked for their toys back. Like this stuff <laughs> has time and a reason to be there, but we've kind of evolved our way from there. And we really need to start thinking about like this problem set in a modern way. And we don't have to do it in hard mode, right? Like this is something that we can evolve our way to and figure out like what patterns work for us. So um, the other day we were looking at something about S, uh, not even SNMP, it was IPMI, like the V1 spec with a Cypher C3 and we're like, Shoot me now! Like, why am I looking at something that is so decrepitly old? My grandpappy used this interface. <laughs> yeah, like, well, and that's why I threw that. that. My my nineteen ninety six self called and was like, "I'm sorry that you have to go suffer through this." Right. <laughs> well, yeah, that's why I threw that screenshot on there. Right. Is like you can oh look at God. these things and you can see the the, the history the that's that's bundled into these things. <laughs> like, there's there's HTML stuff from like two thousand one in here. <laughs> 
there's Java applets still. Like that just that's oh, the one that gosh. just blows me away. Like who does Java applets anymore? No, I'll tell you who. You. <laughs> every single BMC vendor except for OpenBMC. So. Wow. Yeah, or like an iframe. Like throw up an iframe on occasion just to make sure <laughs> get really, really good experience out of this entire thing. <laughs> This is kind of like one of the experiences we have to like begrudgingly deal with because we've never been able to manage our destiny here is really around open BMC or around BMCs. And so if we go to the next um, slide here, like one of the things that we've really started to think about the future differently is like if we said like if we could discard with some of these old patterns, like what would the future look like for us? Like how would we go and think about this stuff differently? If you had the ability to discard IPMI, like would you replace it with a RESTful API? And like basically everybody would be like, oh yeah, of course, like why wouldn't I do that? Why wouldn't I just say like SSH is the pattern that I'm super comfortable with? Like we look at this code base really regularly, we understand what the problems are there. Um, let's just bring it around and do that. Like, And then other pieces along the path is like, what would it look like if we really wanted to actually fully instrument our entire control plane inside of Equinix Metal to figure out stuff like, where is stuff breaking? Like stuff magically goes in the IPMI machine and never comes back out. Like the behavior that we expected didn't behave the way that we wanted to. And what do we do there? Like, how do we go and think about that piece? And that's kind of my goal, right? Which is to get it so that, you know, if a customer makes a API call to our, our public API, and has a problem and they send us a trace ID or we find that trace ID and we go pull it up in, a, in Honeycomb or whatever, um, we can see the trace all the way down. I want to see it all the way down into the server actually doing things inside of that BMC image. So like we could say like, oh, sorry, we couldn't reset the power on you because we have really bad hardware state. Like the fans were spinning at 100% and like all the temperature went out of control. Like we need to go figure out like what's happening possibly on the data center floor. Is there like, cooling mechanical issue, like what's going on here? That type of traceability all the way through the stack is like kind of unheard of because yeah. we've never said like, we're just gonna open the entire Pandora's box on this thing and like go. Yeah, yeah, yes. Right. Yes, so let's let's go to the next uh, slide here and like kind of paint a picture of like, um, one of the problems though is like classic enterprise software mode and, and not to slander any of the BMC developers, they actually do a pretty great job for the market that they need to be in. But one of the problems that we have is like a six month release cycle on software just does not work for our business. Like I can't be beholden to a, a vendor who has a six month test cycle, who can't put that test out to uh, in a production environment and find out did my change actually work to fix the customer's problem or not. Right. Is at the end of the day, the core problem that we're uh, slogging our way through. So. Um, kind of to that end though, like I kind of like to say like, you know, like it takes 10,000 hours to like really get good at something. And if you as an organization are not getting about 10,000 hours plus minus like uh, 15, 15,000 hours of, of practice, like are you actually getting good at doing firmware, firmware development, firmware releasing? How do we go and think about that world tra like traumatically differently to some people um, yeah. to change the way that we want to engage in this. And so for us, like this journey is along OpenBFC, like how do we go and change the final piece, the final component of our hardware stack that we don't really have a tremendous amount of control over, but it tremendously wrecks our entire experience with our hardware. Um, in a prior organization where release cycles for us were like in the magnitude of like tens of thousands of machines at a time, like the homogeneity of that fleet really causes problems to express extremely rapidly. And so when you have, when you're releasing something onto 10,000 machines at a time or magnitudes of 10,000 machines at a time, like you get to see like those problems pop up. But if you're a hardware vendor, like you're doing these QA tests on 10 machines, like I'm pretty right. sure like you can plot that course quickly and say like 10 machines is not accumulating the sufficient amount of volume and or hours to be able to express a problem rapidly for you to be able to find the problem and resolve that problem in your production fleet. That's the reality of it, right? Like there's this huge feedback loop that doesn't happen on the enterprise side of the world where they are operating 100,000 machines consistently time and time again They can find that problem for you overnight to resolve your business issue that you have. Like a runaway fan inside of your fan control loop is really wrecking your life because it's causing a recirculation of hot air inside of the machine and causing a really bad feedback loop. How do we find that quickly? How do we resolve that? How do we get that release into our production environment without a tremendous amount of testing, but we have a really good um, 
assumption around like this actually thought like fixing our problems. Well, testing is not the, actually the goal, right? Like our goal is to gain enough confidence to push the code to production. Yep. Like that, that's always been the, the, the actual goal of testing I, in my, my world anyway. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so the other thing that we started postulating here is said like, if we just throw out, like if we threw out every like caution to the wind, right. And said like, let's go rethink this world. Like what would this world look like? And we've been postulating and a thought process around this is like, what if you really thought about that BMC as just a microservice? Like every single BMC is a brand new microservice that you're instantiating and it's doing something as part of your software stack. What would the world change and look like for you? And this is where Amy and I have been talking about this pretty heavily. Like we do really need to start thinking about tracing like our control plane all the way through the hardware, how it interacts with our hardware and comes back into our control plane and provides that experience for a customer. Like, how do we do this? What other things do we need to change along the way to make that a possibility? And then what other experiences do you enable as a side effect of that? So like, what other things, what other wild things that you never would have been able to do before can you start doing? Can I discard SNMP? Like, can I just like get rid of that thing? Like it's it, it oh. done. Really, really <laughs> but what if I wanted to bring like a net like a native Prometheus export to this? Like like that is an unheard of like engagement with anybody who does commercial software to go say like, yeah, can, can you just like give me the native Prometheus exporter? Like, no, like you can't do that. Like, yeah. why would you like why would like if, like why on earth would like SNMP not solve the problem for you? Like, of course you want SNMP, right? Like, but like, so how about this SNMP thing? Like, I got SNMP for you, like. Like I, I heard you like metric, but SNMP is here for metrics. Like, isn't that the same? I, thing? I understand SNMP these days. What it stands for is go after yourself. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> or maybe something else like IPMI. I, I, I think we have like. Sorry to interrupt, but we have like two minutes left. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> but like, let me throw one final thing out there. Like, we can we can go down this path. Um, so, like, maybe like, what if like I, IPMI like serial land is like one of those things that everybody loves to death, right? Like, because like I just need like eyes on my machine. But like, what if I need eyes on my machine from orbit? Like, what does this look like? Can I go like jam in Mosh and like have a really entertaining conversation around? The thing that I need to do is high latency. I need to go and think about this very differently. I have a really bad subsea cable connection. Like how do I go and change the world a little bit? So like really churning like the thought process on its head and like really addressing the customer problems that we have here rapidly and putting those things into production. Yeah, nice. In conclusion, yeah. Yes, you can have nice things if you try really, really hard. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I did want to talk about, like, we, we kind of ran out of time, but um, one of the interesting things with this process of moving forward is that it comes, that we have to have kind of two feedback loops. Um, so just to leave a thought for people, right? Because a lot of hardware folks that are facing this want, want to move into this shiny world where we test things in minutes um, and get things onto, like, into like a test environment, like a virtual machines or something, but we still have to test and validate against actual hardware. And so the, the secret seems to be to just accept that and have mm -hmm. two feedbacks, right? That, mm. that are aligned and running in parallel. So you have your, you know, when people push to main, you run mm -hmm. the fast C CI cycle. And when, when that you gain confidence there or like nightly or whatever, you push it to actual hardware where, mm -hmm. you know, you can control the cost, constrain it down and then you don't have contention and things like that. So I think that's kind of the, the really big thing we wanted to offer in less than a minute. That's awesome. Were there any questions for us? Jeremy, you're muted. Grace, you're muted. Every single time. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, some, somewhat quiet in the chat was, uh, was fairly well covered. Um, since we had a moment, I was going to do the shameless thing and say, like, I, I very much enjoyed the picture of the, the happy developer and the sad developer. And if you wanted to be, if you wanted to be the happy developer, I think all of your organizations are currently um, hiring. And that might be the, uh, if, if those are your, uh, if those are your beliefs and telling us how it's going to be there. Um, the I'm best sure way to become a really high performing engineer is to find a team where they do things right, more or less. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing I took away from this. I was staring at the honeycomb.io site and I kept thinking about like the phrase you see when you get there, which is stop letting complexity slow you down. And it's really interesting. And I think you all spoke to this, how when you inject thoughtfulness into 
how you set up your systems, whether it's hardware or software, whatever it is, and you allow for folks to think creatively. Like, intention. Yeah, like what Maya yeah. was saying, like just turn the problem on its head and think of like the, the pulse of it, the heart of it, as opposed to just seeing everything kind of in this vacuum of, well, this is a technical problem, right? Really seeing it as this impacts the lives of the humans. Almost never technical. The, yeah. Right. Like, like that's one of the things like reliability, yeah. observability, both. I mean, have the, have the same thing. Like we have to, if we want more reliable software, if we want more, our people to be happy, we have to change the culture. We have to change the system. Um, it's not just so about doing things, writing better code. I mean, it's, it's about creating the, the socio-technical system that allows people to write and ship swiftly and safely. There's a late breaking question. Uh, it is what observability signal is a good place to start? Uh, that's a Pantera's box, I, I guess. It, it has the standard en engineering answer, which is it depends. Um, usually the, the advice I've been giving folks and kind of what I'm doing at Metal right now is um, the first thing that I usually get people to do is like get the plumbing turned on for, for everything, right? Like, and it is, it is a plumbing job, right? Getting like your open telemetry set up into your code, getting integrated, get the auto instrumentation turned on. That's just the beginning, right? Um, and, and that's the important thing is like, don't stop there. Cause a lot of people will, they'll get the auto instrumentation turned on and be like, I have observability, right? But where it starts to get super powerful is when you have that plumbing laid into all of your projects. And what we really want is not to tell developers where did they start, what signals to put, to put in, but to give them the tools so that when they're writing their code and doing those fast feedback loops that Charity talked about, and they notice go like, Hey, that looks important. If you love it, put a trace on it. Right. <laughs> and so, yeah. and that's, yeah. that's really it's what all, it comes down it's to. All about, to like, it's about helping you be in constant conversation with your code. I can't tell you what you're trying to do. So I can't tell you what the important signal is, but it's about, like Amy said, laying all the plumbing so that you can see what's important. Final jeopardy though. If you had to write one down on the page. One, one, uh, it would be, one it would be a single, a single signal. Single signal anywhere. There's a network hop is where I yes. would start. Right. Yep. Awesome. Well, thank you all. Because so any time that any time there's a network hop, you've discarded all of your context. Fair. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Bye. Thanks, Sarah. Well, that was a great conversation. Super riveting, and um, learned a lot. Like it's it's almost like it's a master class. Like you just kind of sit here and soak it all in. Ooh, day's going days going real fast. I guess we can roll uh, roll right up to the next. Mm -hmm.